year, it was that doom and gloom message, the way I was introduced at least. Um, and um, it is because the situation in Europe is doom and gloom. But um, this year, it seems like it's, it has gone further. And I, I decided in order to study for this message and, and to prepare it to go to Europe, and you see, Europe is a big continent and, and, and lots of different countries. And of course, in my mind, I need to go to the uh, origins of, or, or at least part of the Roman Empire, if I believe that the Roman Empire is going to be revived and it is going to be the, the place where, uh, or where the Antichrist uh, will come from. So, in a normal circumstance, you will go to Rome if it's a Roman Empire. But I was actually led to go to a different place. And uh, I actually was led to go to Berlin, of all places. And I, I speak German. I studied the German language when I did some things that I don't think you should know. <laughs> and... Um, Sometimes in a cafe in Berlin, you can get more information from your enemy than from the battlefield, just so you know. Um, and I want you to know that um, Berlin, I, I, I guess it, it was the direction of the Holy Spirit, but I, I don't want to assume that. I'm just saying that it was an interesting visit to a city that, to be honest with you, if the rapture took place tomorrow, it wouldn't even know that it happened. <laughs> now, let's, uh, let's ask ourselves, first of all, where did we stop last year? What has happened in Europe since? And what are we to expect in the near future? Which is, you know, quite interesting. I would like to begin with a few uh, quotes from several people. One of them is actually a German-born Jew who uh, fled Germany uh, uh, to the United States, and his name is Albert Einstein. And he said, the minority, the ruling class at present, has the schools and press, usually the church as well, under its thumb. It, this enables it to organize and sway the emotions of the masses and make its tool of them. Profound thing to hear from a, a scientist uh, who was born in Germany and who could see then already these things. But the majority, the minority that we know of, we have to admit that it's no longer a secret because they don't keep it as a secret anymore. It is a cartel of international bankers industrialists based mostly in Western Europe and North America. The names of certain families persist over uh, long periods of time. Some of the most important names you know, Rothschild, we talked about it last time, the Rockefellers, the Morgan, Lazard, Warburg, Schroeder, and Schiff, and there's more. But there's very few very wealthy families in this world that are equally divided both in Western Europe and in North America, that uh, have a mission, and you can look at the Georgia Guidestones, and you can find it there. There's a set of stones that literally depict the, the mission and the goals of that group of people. One of them is to keep Earth population under 500 million. We just heard that we already passed the 6 billion and we're going to get to the 9 billion at some point. And of course, the best way to cut down the uh, population of the world is to create situation where killing, murder, and whether it's babies inside the womb or whether it's people outside, um, is being done in such a way that um, it will serve the interest of mankind. The same David Rockefeller 
wrote in his own book, Memoirs, in page 405, some even believe that we, the Rockefeller family, are part of a secret cabal working against the best interest of the United States, characterizing my family and me as internationalists and of conspiring with others around the world. He's speaking mostly on the other part of the family in Europe. To build a more integrated global political and economic structure. One world, if you will. If that's the charge, I stand guilty and I am proud of it. Now, the same guy in a speech in Germany, in Baden, Germany, in a Bilderberg meeting, said it would have been impossible for us to develop our plan for the world if we had been subjected to the lights of publicity during those years. But... The world is now more sophisticated and prepared to march towards a world government. The supernatural uh, national sovereignty of an intellectual elite and world bankers is surely preferable to the national auto determination practiced in past century. Now, what you see here is that if in the past we were hiding our intentions, and he's saying that on German soil, now, we're no longer hiding it. Now, actually, <laughs> the sophisticated world is uh, allowing us to move forward with it. There was a congressman called Larry McDonald who sort of, in the 1970s, exposed this whole plan. And he wrote... The drive of the Rockefellers and their allies is to create a one-world government combining super-capitalism and communism under the same tent. Do we see more or less what's going on in America today? Do I mean conspiracy? Yes, I do. I am convinced there is such a plot international in scope. You see, it's not only in America. International in scope. Generations old in planning and incredibly evil in intent. Now, he was so deep in his, in his um, effort to uncover this whole thing that they managed to get rid of him and all of that airplane carrying passengers. Um, uh, 747 Korean Airlines that was shut down by the Soviets. Interesting. You know, uh, just before Donald Trump was elected president, I was online. I was at a church on Saturday, and uh, the Lord spoke to me through a message that my father-in-law actually uh, gave. Um, I'm inspired by my father-in-law. Uh, we have other issues with mother-in-laws in Israel. Uh, <laughs> but... Um, I was reminded of the verse, the effective, fervent prayer of the righteous man avails much. It has to be effective, it has to be fervent, and it will never get, go back. Void. I mean, God will use such thing as long as we're righteous people. If we believe in God and we, we are followers of Jesus Christ because He's our righteousness, then of course, we can come before him and, and, and pray in such a way. And it's interesting because we often talk, and we just talked about it, about the restrainer being removed. But he's not removed yet, which means he still restrains. And he restrains supernatural things from happening and catastrophic things from happening. As we all know that once he's out, which means we are out, Things will, will get very, very, very ugly. But as long as he's here in us, there is a power within our prayer to restrain things. And I believe that that prayer of millions of evangelical Christians worldwide to stop that evil from ruling in the United States of America and bringing it even deeper to the 
to the depth of the abyss, I believe that the Lord answered that prayer and the restrainer did restrain. And we know that that effort to push for globalization, one world government, and new world order suffered a major setback with Donald Trump elected as president and of the United States of America. I listened very carefully to his speech in the UN. And if I was a UN delegate, I would be very much ashamed hearing all the truth coming just right at my face and understanding how evil that organization is and how hypocrite it is. I mean, President Trump just gave them a Trump lesson of what he believes they are. But think about it. The effort of those globalists and one world government is now shifting back to Europe because in America it is suffering a setback. Make no mistake, make no mistake. Within your own military intelligence and, of course, politics. I, I, by the way, I believe that Republicans and Democrats alike are infected by this thing. There is a DC elite that has nothing to do with Democrats or Republicans. These are families, that's a cahoot. And I do believe that the Republicans hate Trump as much as the Democrats do. And I can tell you one thing, I can tell you one thing that um, you can see that he is coming from the outside. And you can see that in his attempt to drain the swamp, there's a huge monster that comes out of the swamp right now. <laughs> and saying, what are you talking about, Willis? <laughs> Many of those people are now accusing Russia for inter or some sort of meddling with your elections. Am I right? I'm an Israeli. You know that already. And let me tell you something. Your former president intervened violently in our elections two years ago. He sponsored people to go and help the other candidates so Netanyahu will lose. And if that's not enough, Obama backed Macron in last-minute intervention in French election. In other words, you can see how the shift, it's not working in America, what are we going to do? Let's help the European counterpart to move forward with that thing. And then, of course, they marketed Macron as a potential savior of Europe walking on water just as a messiah with everybody drowning and he might be their savior. It is a very, very known, well-known tactic. You create a crisis, okay? And once you create a crisis, you confuse the people and then you give them hope. When you create a crisis, the crisis began a few years ago. The New York Times actually admit that Obama jump-started the Arab Spring. It's not even a secret. Now, if you try to understand what happened, look at this. Look at the next one and see the global elite is sending one president to jumpstart the Arab Spring, and it backfires in two different directions. One, it goes to create chaos in the Middle East, not anything else. Chaos that leads to the death of more than 700,000 people so far. And millions are displaced. And that chaos led to that vast immigration into Europe that causes so much confusion and despair and the lack of security and stability. And they want a savior. So you see, it worked in two ways, and both ways somehow 
with our understanding of Bible prophecy, both ways serves very well that which we know is going to happen. That crisis, believe it or not, started not just standing in the Islamic University in Cairo in 2009, but more so when, at the time, Secretary of State Clinton decided that Muammar Gaddafi has to be removed. Now, many of you may not know that, but it was almost a third of the emails that, that WikiLeaks released about Clinton were somehow related to Libya. One must uh, ask himself, what is that obsession with Libya? After all, Gaddafi, with all of his shortcomings, and trust me, he wasn't a saint, but Gaddafi was the only stable thing in that area, and Gaddafi actually said to the Europeans, I will be the blockage of African invasion into Europe if you pay me that much money to be able to do that. I'll do that for you. And I need that much money. But then Gaddafi also had his own ideas regarding oil and the price of oil and the way to set the price of oil. And he offered both to the Arab world, the Europeans, and the rest, that we better stop using the petrodollar and start using a gold dinar, which means we're no longer going to base the price on cash that is within countries, but on gold that is within countries. And that, of course, made both the elite in America very insecure and those in Europe that gained much from all of this. They decided to tell Hillary Clinton that it is for her benefit to have him removed so when she runs for presidency, that's her ticket. She moved an evil person from the Middle East and created stability in the prices of oil, whereas therefore there will be great stability in world's markets. But look at this thing. The New York Times reported that even critics understate how catastrophically bad the Hillary Clinton-led NATO bombing in Libya was. What happened is that cork was released and ever since an ongoing flood which we just heard about is going from Libya. Libya is the closest African country to Europe. You just, now, now let me explain how it works so you understand. It is a well-oiled machine. No person gets on the boat without having paid a large sum of money. Just so you know, these are not uh, super poor people. And after he paid a large sum of money, another boat is alerted on the coast of Italy. The boat that is alerted on the coast of Italy is a boat of rescue teams. Okay? So, one boat is leaving the coast of Libya, loaded with people that paid lots of money to the Italian mafia, and another boat is loaded with rescue teams from there, paid by who? You might not believe it, but the number one contributor to the relief organizations that help rescuing and pays them per head is no other else but George Soros. Listen, look what this man said. I believe that national borders are the obstacle in the world. Soros actually will eventually benefit from it because him and MasterCard join forces to profit from immigration in different ways and plans. This man admitted before, in front of cameras, that he did a lot of evil things in the sake of greed, but now he's trying to some make up for them in, in, in ways of helping others. A crisis that we just heard about is unequal to any other thing that has happened in the last, I don't know, 100 years. 
We can see another uh, uh, um, article saying, unable to confront the migrant crisis, Europe is committing suicide. Literally. So after you create the crisis, and there is a crisis, now you create division. It's a known tactic. You create division in different ways. First, you create division within the countries. For the first time. By the way, I was in Berlin um, the week before the elections. And I already saw what's going to happen. You see, I told you I'm not a prophet. You know that. But everyone could see that the crisis is leading to division, and the division is going to be manifested in the election results. And guess what happened? Merkel, yes, she won, but in a much smaller majority. And guess who, for the first time since the fall of the Third Reich, receives a representation in the German Reichstag, the German parliament? It is a very far right-wing nationalist party called Alternative für Deutschland, Alternative for Germany. It was a stunning success for Germany and Europe. That's, uh, uh, that's what people, uh, excuse me, what the stunning success of that, uh, uh, of that political uh, uh, party meant for Germany and Europe is that Germany from within is divided. Europe from within is divided. You had the same thing. We just heard about how Macron was elected. Marie Le Pen was held by the left as almost Nazi. <laughs> they sold everyone that if she's going to win, we're going to go back to the Vichy days, that it's going to be fascist ruling. Therefore, doesn't matter who it is, vote for the other one. Do you know him? No. Uh, we know he's a, guy, a good looking guy, he's married to his teacher. And all. But <laughs> come on, is that how you choose a president to one of the largest economies in the world? So, within the countries, people are divided. And then, of course, there is between the countries division. European states deeply divided on refugee crisis before key summit that they had. And may I say, you can clearly see the core of Western Europe divided from the Eastern plank. The illegal immigration divides Europe and the eastern part, uh, the EU as the eastern part, such as Poland. We heard about Hungary. By the way, the Hungarian president confronted Soros. Soros is Hungarian. Soros paid for the high school and the university tuition for Mr. Orban, just so you know, for the prime minister of, 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 of Hungary. They used to be good friends. Until that prime minister said, well, everything is nice when you help me, but you're about to destroy my country right now. I'm not going to stand for that. So the Czech Republic, Slovenia, and more refused to open their borders. So you see, just as Daniel said, it's going to be a sort of an empire, but it's not going to be that united. It's going to be divided. The iron and clay that don't mix together that which the stone is going to smash, and we know we dealt with who the stone is last time, is indeed divided. We heard that President uh, Juncker delivered a State of the Union address on September 13, and in his address, he fleshed out his plan to, for a, an EU-wide army, which he is attempting to push through without the consent of the voters. Hmm. Not only that, today, Europe is having two different institutions. There is the European Commission and the European Council. He wants to combine the two, and that will be a move that would transform the EU leadership and consolidate authority in a single figure who would campaign for the post. And that's going to be the, for the first time since the fall of the Roman Empire, Europe will have a single ruler, not by war, not Hitler, 
but by in peaceful means. You have to understand, if you go back, Europe uh, was under the Roman Empire from 27 BC to 395 AD. That was the Roman Empire that Daniel spoke about as the one that destroyed the temple in Jerusalem at the time. But then he continued speaking of it in future terms, as if it will be revived. But that was the height of the Roman Empire in 117 AD. Look at how big it used to be. Very, very vast. All over Western Europe and, of course, the Turkey, Syria, Lebanon, Egypt, and the northern African coast. But many of you may not know that once the European emperor, the, the Roman emperor, converted to Christianity. Well, he, he didn't really convert. He, he said if he can't beat them, join them. His mother is the one who converted, Helena. This caused a division. And while the Byzantine Empire moved to the east and Rome is no longer the capital, and that's why it wasn't called anymore Roman Empire, it moved to Byzantion, which is Istanbul of today, but it, it was also Constantinople, named after Constantine. Then we had the Western Roman Empire in 395 to 476, and that is all the way on the very end of France, Portugal, and Spain, with some of the coast of Northern Africa. And the Byzantine Empire continued all the way until 1453 when we have um, the final um, destruction of it. Now comes the interesting thing. I was in Berlin and I went to see some things uh, from different time periods. And I was asking myself, why is it that Hitler called his kingdom the Third Reich? I mean, everybody's talking about the Third Reich, but what was the First Reich? What was the Second Reich? Why are we in the Third already? And I realized that uh, apparently the First Reich, if you go to Wikipedia and Google that name, you'll find out that when the Pope commissioned the German king to rule Western Europe, it is considered both the First Reich in their history and the Holy Roman Empire. Did you know that? Did you know that there was a Holy Roman Empire? From 800 AD to 1806. It is Napoleon who put an end to it. That little guy was very active. <laughs> and that's the map of the Holy Roman Empire. Guess who comprised the majority and who is the heart of it and who is the center of it of the, third, of the First Reich? Absolutely Germany. Then came the Second Reich. When you look at the history books, it's the German Empire under the German Kaiser, Kaiser Wilhelm and others, that was there from 1871 to 1918. End of World War I. And that was the map of that one. Then, of course, Germany went through some... Um, some other uh, 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 parts in their history um, not, too, not too pleasant because they had to recover from a very humiliating treaty in Versailles. And then in 1923, there's a book written by a German author called Arthur Müller van der Bruck, which is the ideology which heavily influenced the Nazi party. And the book formulated an ideal of a national empowerment which resounded throughout a Germany desperate to rebuild from the Treaty of Versailles. And he called his book Das Dritte Reich, the Third Reich. And this is why when Hitler came into power in 1933, until the end of that horrible time period, it was known as the Third Reich. And his expansion plan were, of course, way beyond Europe. He wanted to take over the entire uh, Russian part. And now the question is remain. 
are we going to see a fourth one? It's interesting because definitely Berlin situated itself to be much more than just a city for the Germans. You go to the, and we saw it last time, you go to the Berlin um, Museum of Pergamon, you see that since 1930, the altar of Zeus, known as the seat of Satan, taken piece by piece from Pergamon in Turkey, all the way brought to Berlin. You see, you guys protested for the reconstruction of the Arch of Baal. This is not a reconstruction. That's the real deal. And it is in Berlin. Not only that, remember, the Ishtar Gate, one of the gates of Babylon, was taken by Rome, uh, German um, uh, uh, archaeologists and brought in. The whole thing is in Berlin right now. Berlin has the gate of Babylon and the seat of Satan in its midst. Now, I told you that Mr. Junkers is thinking about a new military power. What you may not know is that foreign report reported May 22nd of this year, Germany is quietly building a European army under its command. Quite interesting, isn't it? When they reported that uh, the former president or chancellor of Germany, Mr. Helmut Kohl, died, and he's the one who actually was the architect of the reunification of Germany once the wall fell in 1990, when they reported that he died and there is a memorial service, I expected all the world leaders to fly to Berlin, or to fly to Germany at least, because he's a German guy and that's Germany's business. I was, I, I was found dumbfounded. <laughs> well, I was found dumbfounded. Never mind. <laughs> that his whole, his entire um, memorial service was not even in Germany. It was in the parliament of Europe without even a German flag, but with the European one. In other words, Germany is positioning itself not as Germany, but as what? The ruler of? Correct, of Europe. I stumble at a, um, a survey that was done three to four months ago throughout the European Union. Several questions strike my uh, uh, attention. First of all, how likely do you expect that a terrorist attack like what happened in Paris last year, in Brussels or in Berlin, could happen in your country? Look what happened. 37% said very likely, and 48% said somewhat likely. You, you're talking about more than 80% of the people believe that there is an imminent threat of terrorism. How serious a problem do you believe that is the illegal immigration are coming into your country? Very serious, 50%. Only somewhat serious, 31%. 81% see that as a problem. How much do you trust the following institution? Your own government. 51% say, not at all. So, <laughs> when you create a crisis, and you create division, you create distrust of these people in their own countries and their own le leaders, then somebody is looking for someone else. The chaos, despair, and hopelessness are needed in order to wait for a deliverer. And they will accept him the moment he surfaces. I think we, we, we quoted that several times. Now, Michelle Bachmann just gave us an outstanding report on what's going on in Europe regarding the demographical uh, 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 issue. Of course, the Europeans are committing, in a sense, a suicide. George 
Weigel, a distinguished senior fellow of Washington, D.C.'s Ethics and Public Policy, excuse me for, um, he attended the European Parliament and he gave a speech. And he wrote, Europe is committing demographic suicide, systematically depopulating itself in what British historian Niall Ferguson has called the greatest sustained reduction in European populations since the Black Death in the 14th century. I'm not talking about the immigration. The immigration is their answer. I'm talking about the Europeans themselves. This unwillingness to create the future in the most elemental sense by creating new generation is at the root of many of Europe's problems, including its difficulties assimilating immigrants and its fiscal distress. When an entire continent, healthier, wealthier, and more secure than ever before, deliberately chooses sterility and the most basic cause for that must lie in the realm of human spirit in a certain sorrowing ab about the very mystery of being. Now, it's interesting because after his speech, the Italian representative in the European Parliament came to him and said, look, we know we're finished. We're trying to arrange these things so that we can die comfortably in our beds. Don't you Yanks come over here and start stirring things up. <laughs> they understand that they're on their deathbed. They're not interested in your opinion. They're not interested in warning. They are just interested in remaining comfortable in their deathbed. This is the one that... Um, was stolen from me. <laughs> I don't complain, you know. I think they should hear it again. The prime ministers of presidents of Europe's largest economies and of all European members of the exclusive global club, the G7, are without children. Germans, Angela Merkel, Great Britain's Theresa May, Italy's Paolo Gentile, Gentiloni and France's Emmanuel Macron add to this mix the childless Dutch Prime Minister Mark Rutte and the childless Prime Minister of Luxembourg Javier Bettel and something quite striking comes into focus of the six founding members of what has evolved into the European Union. Five are now led by childless Prime Ministers or Presidents. That's not, you know, it's not only about demography. The moral decline is staggering. Just about a few months ago, a little boy called Charles Matthew William Gard, who suffered from a very rare disease, was sentenced to death by the British Parliament. How? His parents admitted him to a British hospital, but then they found out that there is an experimental treatment in the United States. President Trump today, at that time candidate Trump, offered help. The court in Europe said no, and he was disconnected from the machine and died. And by the way, this is the one we know we know of. There are thousands of people that the European hospitals disconnect from life support every day because life is meaningless right now. And don't forget, we have to reduce Earth's population. So let's help doing so. The moral decline is staggering when you see a fashion show in an Anglican cathedral in London last month <laughs> with the models wearing this satanic outfit with satanic emblem hanging on their necklace, Nostri Satanas Luciferi. It's no longer under the ground, it's above the ground. 
Europe is choosing to commit suicide. Europe is choosing Satan and God to be mocked in a house of God, or at least what used to be one. Last year, and the year before when I was here, we quoted the British historian Arnold Toynbee, that he said that the nations are ready to give the kingdoms of the world to anyone, man, who will offer a solution to our world's problems. And the first president of the United Nations General Assembly, Paul Henry Spack, who also was the prime minister of Belgium and one of the early planners of the EU, he said, we do not want another committee. We have too many already. What we want is a man of sufficient stature to hold the allegiance of all the people and to lift us up out of the economic morass into which we are sinking. Send us such a man, whether he's, he will be God or the devil, we will receive him. So, first of all, you create a crisis. Then you divide the people. And now you offer them hope. Interesting. Look how the elite in Europe is playing with your minds, but mostly with their minds. They start sending deliverers. The younger, the better. It started in 2015 when Alexis Tsipras uh, was elected as Prime Minister of, 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 of Greece at that time in a huge crisis. And he's still the Prime Minister. By the way, he was Prime Minister, then went, there was elections and was re-elected. Continued this May 2017 when Emmanuel Macron is now 39 years old, the President of France. And by the way, he's not the Messiah. He's a forerunner. They're testing the water with such people to see if Europe is ready. Now, you think that's young? Look at the next one. He's about to be the president, the prime minister of Austria. How old is he? 31. He's a foreign minister right now. He's 29. He was appointed when he was 29. And the interesting thing is, believe it or not, all three are very different from a man called Adolf Hitler who wanted to rule Europe. They are pleasant, nice, young, and believe it or not, they offer hope to their people in the midst of the despair. And if I may take you to my angle, Israel, they're good friends of Israel, believe it or not. Tsipras is a very good friend of Netanyahu. He's actually, we're signing some very interesting deals right now for gas and oil pipeline. Macron said that he's not going to have any unilateral um, measures in, 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 in unlike his predecessor. And, may I say, Sebastian Kurz is one of our best friends, just so you know. <laughs> Why is it so important? And who is the next one? Who might be the one over all of Europe? We're not sure. But why is it so important that they like Israel. You, you have to understand something. This is one thing a lot of Bible teachers tend to ignore or overlook. The Antichrist has to be a good friend of Israel, has to serve the interests of the people of Israel and the Jewish people, has to be liked by them to the point of even worship by them. You cannot, people, people tell me, well, it has to be Erdogan. Erdogan is the biggest anti-Semite I've ever seen. Not even a single Israeli would ever think of him as his own Messiah. You have to be someone else. Now, probably you're, you're saying, how can a Jew look at a non-Jewish European leader as a Messiah? It's just too much. Well... It's not too much because that man has to solve the problems not only of Europe and not only give hope to the world. That's not going to be enough. The whole fame will be nothing if he's not accepted by the Jews. <laughs> and if you want an example of someone who tried that before, 
Look at this interesting article. Napoleon, a modern day messiah. Now, probably you're looking at me and saying, What are you talking about, Willis? Watch this. We just found a 200 year old coin. On one side, a portrait of Napoleon that appears on the side with uh, uh, surrounded by the inscription Napoleon, King and Emperor. So far, so good. Let's flip the coin. Napoleon is portrayed in imperial dress, granting a kneeling French Jew the tablets of the Ten Commandments. Inscribed under the figure are the phrase, the Grand Sanhedrin, and the date Napoleon announced its convention on May 30th, 1806. The Jews in France had hope in Napoleon to be the one who will deliver them from the hatred that was all over France at that time against the Jews. And they were so thrilled that he, for the first time, convened 71 Jewish leaders to match the number of the Grand Sanhedrin in Jerusalem of the ancient times. And he basically bought their support and their friendship. The Antichrist has to be a friend of Israel, has to buy the trust of the Jewish people by ways of allowing them to rule once again even on the Temple Mount, allowing them to build the Temple on the Temple Mount. And when the time comes, and by the way, all Jews pray for the coming of the Messiah that will be manifested in the rebuilding of the temple, peace, stability, and prosperity. And for the first three and a half years, let's face it, it will be good. It will be so good until comes something very interesting. What is it that the Jewish people refuse to accept in Jesus? Not that he is the Messiah. <laughs> they never said to him, you are not the Messiah. Never. Because in their mindset, the Messiah is a man. Anointed by God, but a man. So he could have been the Messiah. Their problem with Jesus, for which they called him a blasphemer, someone who is that he admitted, he said, I and the Father are one. I am caught in the flesh. That's too much. The understanding of the Jews that the Messiah is someone who will bring prosperity and peace is still there. And that's why they will walk after him, whoever he's going to be. But the minute the Antichrist will go into the temple and declare himself as what? That's where they say, enough is enough. We did not accept that one 2,000 years ago. We surely are not going to accept you. And this is when Israel will have its most terrible time known as the trouble of Jacob. So you see, Europe is definitely ready, closer than ever, to the birth of the one who will have to introduce that peace and prosperity and who will be greatly embraced by the Jewish people. But as we heard from my friend JD, first, something has to happen. The catalyst has to take place. A war, and I, I want to believe that that war is also the sign for us to be out of here, has to take place. And when that war takes place in the Middle East, Islam is no longer powerful. And that is when a European leader can easily 
offer Jerusalem to the Jewish people without any substantial resistance from the Muslim world. Today, the Saudi king visited Putin and reiterated the fact that the Saudis will not accept any solution but that Jerusalem, the old city at least, the East Jerusalem they call it, will be the capital of the next Palestinian state, of the future Palestinian state. I mean, right now the Muslims will not accept any solution that will not have Jerusalem as their capital. But once they lose in the mother of all wars, which is Ezekiel's war. Why do I call it the mother of all wars? As far as the Israel is concerned, first time ever that a superpower invades into Israel. All of our wars since 1948, we were fighting our Arab neighbors. That's all. Maybe superpowers helped them, but never ever a superpower invaded into Israel. This is going to be the first time that Russia with troops will actually invade into Israel. Now, how come America is not going to help us? We already heard the different options. Why are you so depressed? <laughs> I want to remind all of you that if then you were raised with Christ, Seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your minds on the things above, not on the things on earth. Trust me, you, want, you don't want to think of, of those things on earth. For our citizenship indeed is in heaven, from which we eagerly wait. Brother J.D. said that he is eagerly waiting for us. He is, and we eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly bodies that it may be conformed to His glorious One. So I hope all of us understand that this is about the hope and not about despair. This is it. We're in the finish line. We're running the race and we have to run it with endurance. And we have to look at Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much that in this world of chaos, despair, lack of hope, lack of stability, lack of peace, we know who is our peace. We know who gives us the stability and what is that blessed hope that we have. Father, we thank you that he who promised is also faithful and that he will come and indeed the day is approaching. Father, we're praying that in the midst of of all that is happening, you will use us today because that's the only reason you left us still here, to occupy, to spread the gospel, to preach the word, and to give that hope and that peace that surpasses all understanding to the people around us. Let us give them the gospel the pill that we took in order to get eternal life and the pill that you gave us enough so we can give to others. We bless your name today from Eden Prayer, Minnesota. And we ask, Father, that in these last days you will grant us the wisdom and the endurance to not just run the race, but finish the race. We thank you and we bless you, and we ask all of this in the matchless name of the Holy One of Israel, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Lion of Judah, who came as the Lamb of God, who will return as, as the amazing ruler of the whole world, 
and he will reign from Jerusalem over the whole world and he will be with us and we will be with him forever and ever. In his name we pray, in the name of Yeshua, Jesus we pray, and all of God's people say, Amen. Amen. Amen.